Uh, just so great to see Safcon uh, developing now to what it is. I'm looking, uh, I was just chatting with Sam, who was one of our first uh, special operations students here as a late career Yale College student and helped found this special operations conference at Yale in 2016. And since then, uh, under the leadership of uh, of Emma Sky and the support of, uh, of Mr. Kaplan, you know, we've developed uh, this PRK Fellows Program at the Jackson School for Global Affairs at Yale, which has really, you know, helped bring the special operations community into contact uh, with the outstanding resources that we have here on the Yale campus uh, and its teaching and research mission. But I actually think it's just as beneficial, if not more, for the students who are not in that community. Uh, and so to be able to learn and interact with all of you on a daily basis, you know, the work that Mike and his colleagues have done in putting this conference together, uh, it's inspirational for our students. It helps enhance the public service mission uh, of what we're trying to do at Yale. And it's been central to this effort to build this Jackson School of Global Affairs at Yale. So it's the first uh, new school that Yale has created in nearly 50 years since our business school and reflects a real commitment to putting challenges in diplomacy and international security, you know, front and center uh, at the mission of the university in really exciting ways. Uh, I'm Ted Wittenstein. I teach at the Jackson School and at the law school, and I oversee our international security studies program here at the Jackson School, which includes um, what we now call the Schmidt program on artificial intelligence, emerging technologies, and national empower. And so thanks to Dr. Schmidt, he has really helped resource our teaching and learning uh, an interdisciplinary approach to thinking about how AI is changing the nature of world order. I see a number of students who are in uh, a few of the classes that me and other colleagues uh, teach at Yale in this space. And it's hard because it's such a rapidly uh, changing field. And it's hard to predict even what another six months of chat GPT X or something will bring uh, as the number continues to change. And so part of what we're trying to do is create um, a greater technical fluency among our non-STEM students. So how do we develop that among our <coughs> aspiring law and policy leaders? And then in reverse, because we have so many STEM students in our own courses and connected to us around the Yale campus, how do we develop that hybrid law, policy, ethical appreciation for their research agenda? How do we integrate that? and maybe create a, a model for a best practice that might extend as we think about pipeline challenges in public service and some of the comments that Mr. Ennis was just making. So we have an outstanding technology panel to continue the conversation, uh, really terrific expertise, uh, both in the science uh, and, and technology of AI uh, and quantum computing. I'll introduce uh, Dr. Krishnan and Dr. Gervin um, in just a moment, and then we have some outstanding uh, private sector expertise as well that I'm eager to incorporate uh, and I'll introduce Mike Hayes uh, and Sam Hussein as we go. But we'll try to keep this interactive um, and fun. So Dr. Krishnan is the W.W. Cooper, uh, Ruth Cooper Professor of Management Science and Information Systems at Carnegie Mellon University and he's Dean uh, of the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy at the university uh, since 2009. Uh, he's been a faculty member as well in engineering and public policy, uh, really embodies this connection of hybrid uh, tech and policy fluency that we need uh, to grapple with AI uh, and the risks and opportunities. Uh, he's a member of the National AI Advisory Committee. As many of you know, this is a national level effort to try to harness best practices uh, from academia uh, to inform uh, government thinking. So I wanted to start with some comments from Dr. Krishnan uh, on how he thinks about uh, AI, both the risks and opportunities, in particular its relevance to this audience. Uh, I was struck, uh, I, I like Mr. Ennis's comments about uh, being wary of people who try to sprinkle AI dust uh, on everything. And you've uh, given a lot of thought, Dr. Krishnan, to uh, what it really means to develop a full AI stack really the significant components, both from hardware uh, all the way through data and algorithms to integration to human people. And so just give us a sense of how you think about and scope this challenge. What concerns you most about the current environment, but also what are some of the opportunities that you think might be of, of relevance to this audience? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ted. Um, 
<clears throat> pardon the hoarseness in my voice. I sort of seem to have allergies. Uh, so, um, uh, so thank you again for the invitation to be here to Ash and uh, to Ash Raja Raman and uh, to Mike uh, to invite me to come here. Uh, it's been a great learning experience listening to uh, speakers this morning. Um, and um, as Ted was uh, talking about um, what Yale has put together here uh, with uh, Special Operations Command, uh, we have a similar relationship at Carnegie Mellon uh, with the U.S. Army. Uh, there's the Army AI Center at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, the Army Futures Command sends um, uh, officers uh, for education at Carnegie Mellon uh, in AI, and we also um, uh, address uh, senior leadership, one stars, two stars, on data-driven leadership, and I can speak to that as an important aspect of the human capital aspects associated with the discussion that we've been, that we've been having. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Ted talked about the AI stack. The AI stack is something that um, uh, Carnegie Mellon developed uh, to organize uh, and frame the discussion about the different components of AI technology that are relevant to um, how it's going to be deployed be it commercially, be it in government, be it in, um, in, in, uh, to address the kinds of questions that we are hearing uh, about today. <clears throat> and it ranges, and it, in some ways, for those of you who are very familiar with uh, the OODA or OODA stack, the observe, um, you know, the, each of these different elements of that stack, the AI stack is sort of organized similarly. At the bottom layer is the sensing or perception layer. Uh, and increasingly, that layer... Um, is in hardware, um, and this is about audio, video, uh, multimodal text-based uh, perception, um, and that those signals that are perceived are then that, that's equals to the observation, uh, the ODA stack, um, and that perception then feeds into a signal processing um, layer, <clears throat> which tries to make sense of what's uh, being actually perceived. Um, and then that then feeds into this learning layer. And for a long, long time now, I mean, there's been tremendous developments in the learning stack, uh, which in itself, um, as you know, has, has had tremendous amount of progress, particularly in the field of deep learning um, and neural network architectures. Um, everybody's been uh, excited about what's happened since the release of uh, Chat GPT and these so-called large language models, uh, they are all at the, at the learning layer of being able to take vast amounts of uh, corpora. So for instance, Chat GPT-4 was trained on 570 gigabytes of, uh, of text and other kinds of corpora, be it code from GitHub, be it images from Getty Images, uh, video. So it's this immense amount of input that's gone into the training of these neural networks. Um, and these models have grown in size as well. Uh, the chat GPT-4 has what's called 170 billion parameters in the neural network. So that learning layer, as the size of the training corpora and the size of these models have increased, the capacity and the capabilities of these models um, ranges from you know, the kinds of capabilities you've seen exhibited by ChatGPT. Um, and ChatGPT is one of many large language models. Google has something called BARD, and there's lots of different kinds of powerful models that are being developed by organizations. I was with, at an emerging tech event a couple of weeks ago, and Adobe has its own <coughs> large language model for images and video. And increasingly, you're seeing the integration of these learning layers and the output of those capabilities in personal productivity tools, uh, be it the Microsoft stack, as Microsoft has announced, or Adobe, or Google Mail, et cetera. The learning stack then feeds into a, a decision-making layer. Um, so what is it that's been learned? How can it actually support decision-making, um, where you're using the patterns that have been learned, and importantly, even potentially causally understanding the relationships between uh, what's being observed, and what decision to take. And this is where it could be a very useful decision support device, uh, particularly to the human, um, in, and this is the human in the loop, 
but it could equally well potentially support decision making autonomously. That's the decision making layer. The decision making layer then on top of that resides the action layer. So the stack then, at a very minimum, you could think of it as having these four layers the perception layer, the learning layer, the decision making layer, and the action layer. And these different layers can be deployed via the enterprise, it can be deployed at the edge conditional on the constraints of the technology. Uh, imagine uh, a large language model. Today, I don't think we have the, the, the devices to actually deploy it directly on a mobile device, but you could, because it takes Im immense amount of compute and data power to train these models. But once trained, could you imagine an image of these models that could be um, uh, put on a, on a device that could be on a disconnected, not connected to the network, not the way we use ChatGPT today with an API, but imagine it being on a mobile device disconnected. That could potentially change the nature of uh, the deployment and the edge for the kinds of use cases that were being discussed uh, earlier today. Um, and um, the uh, nature of these uh, capabilities, if you think of this, is what I've described entirely is a, a technology stack and an associate, associated set of capabilities, the biggest challenges has been, have been how do you get people trained with the skills to be able to effectively use this technology stack? So just to give you an, an example of something, uh, we work, like I said, with the U.S. Army. They send us AI technicians. There's technician training. There are officers being trained for being data engineers or data scientists. And then the leadership has to understand how best to put this uh, trained human capital to use in the field using this technology. If, if you train these folks and then put them back to work doing exactly the same old thing they did before they did the training, and that's not much point. And therefore, the, the futures command training set, if you think of this as a pyramid, at the top end of the pyramid are the PhDs and the masters. Uh, then come a very large number of people who are going to be deployers. And then there are lots of operators. That's the AI technicians, the officers being data scientists and data engineers, plus people who are actually going to create the tech. So you need a very holistic view. And I think of this as a human capital stack that has to stand side by side with the technology stack uh, to actually get the most value out of this. So let me stop here, Ted, and I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities uh -huh. to build on this discussion. All right, thank you so much. <coughs> I'm gonna try to uh, save myself and all my questions uh, for just a minute, because uh, I wanna incorporate uh, some of the other expertise that we have. So just shifting from AI for a moment uh, to quantum <laughs> computing, I was also struck uh, by Mr. Innes's comments about uh, you know just the challenge of grappling with emerging technologies uh, with unclear time horizons and impact, uh, and quantum computing strikes me as an area where this is a particularly acute challenge. So uh, very grateful to have uh, Dr. Gerben with us. Uh, he's been a member of the Yale faculty since 2001. He's the Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics and Applied Physics. Uh, he's had some significant university administration roles here, including as uh, deputy provost for research, kind of overseeing uh, <laughs> Yale's overall uh, strategic planning and resource allocation uh, and personnel decisions uh, with respect to the sciences across Yale. Uh, and he returned to this to full-time teaching at Yale in 2017. Uh, but that's not all uh, that he does. He is, of course, himself an exceptional uh, scholar in, in the theoretical studies of quantum uh, many particle systems. He's been part of setting up the Yale Quantum Institute, which is a really significant effort, uh, which is sort of developing, uh, you know, a practical architecture for construction of a quantum computer, uh, which has won numerous uh, acclaim, uh, both uh, nationally as well as around the world. And in addition to his teaching, he was the founder uh, and still is a member uh, of the Center uh, for Quantum Advantage, uh, which is a part of the Brookhaven National Laboratory and a Department of Energy funded effort to try to harness a better national approach to understanding both the risks uh, as well as the opportunities that quantum computing might hold. So Steve, I wanted to bring you uh, into the conversation with respect to quantum. Uh, you know, this is an audience with varying levels of knowledge about this, uh, promises as well as 
uh, all sorts of hyperbole perhaps as well that's been out been thrown out there before so maybe help us think about what you see as the most uh, you know significant applications of quantum computing uh, and their national security implications both benefits and risks and you know what uh, a military audience uh, should know and start thinking about as, as you grapple with the timelines uh, and your outstanding research in this area. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ted. Uh, so you guys have been throwing a lot of acronyms at me today, so I feel like I should start with a, a little bit of vocabulary and maybe some historical context about what, what is this all about. So, um, you know, the one of the main pillars of physics is classical mechanics, the, the theory um, of, invented by Isaac Newton more than 300 years ago for that determines, you know, the orbits of satellites and missiles, um, the, the orbit of the moon and so forth. It's fantastically successful theory. Um, and, uh, but it only applies to, to sort of large objects. Something goes wrong when you get down to the scale of individual atoms or individual electrons. And uh, we needed a new theory beginning about 100 years ago. Uh, the quantum theory was <coughs> invented. Uh, and that led to what I'll call the first quantum revolution beginning a century ago that brought us the transistor the laser and the atomic clock, which led to GPS, uh, and the entire 20th century technology revolution was built on these first quantum devices. But there's now a second quantum revolution underway. It has huge promise, maybe uh, a lot of hype for sure, very uncertain uh, timelines. But it has the potential to be possibly as big a revolution as the one that brought us the 20th century tech revolution. And it's based on a not, not a new theory of quantum, but a new understanding of this 100-year-old theory and the role of information content in quantum states. And we now realize that the transistor, the laser, and the atomic clock while quantum machines, they don't harness the full power that is actually available in quantum machines and quantum technology. And uh, so the sort of three use cases that are relevant to this audience are quantum sensing. It turns out in, in the quantum theory, you have to think deep, <laughs> deeply about what is a measurement, what is detecting something. And it's more complicated and subtle than in classical physics uh, because when you measure something, it, it changes. But it's important to you for the detection of extremely weak signals, small magnetic anomalies uh, near uh, overhead above submarines, uh, gravitational anomalies over uh, caves and mountains, um, uh, weak radio signals, et cetera. Uh, the kind of quantum limited amplifiers that we build for our quantum computers could easily, uh, they work in cell phone frequency ranges, they can easily detect uh, uh, or perhaps even be overloaded by a cell phone on the moon. Um, the second is quantum encryption and communication. Current cryptographic protocols are more or less uniformly based on the difficulty of some math problem, solving some math problem. Uh, quantum encryption uh, it, security is based on uh, our inability to violate the laws of physics. It's a different, um, different setup. And then finally, quantum computation, the ability to process information in completely new ways uh, compared to traditional, what I'll call classical computers. It's a completely new model of computation. Certain uh, problems which uh, computer scientists classify as 
uh, difficult or exponentially hard as you raise the size of some database are uh, not necessarily exponentially hard on if you have if you can build a um, quantum computer. So it's not it's their their advantages do <coughs> not come from having a faster clock speed. Often the clock speed, at least today, is slower than the highly developed, uh, rap fast classical computers we have today. But it's a completely different model, which for certain classes of problems, uh, they can be solved more readily on quantum hardware. Uh, so, for example, we're, we're in, you only need a few thousand quantum bits to do something extremely interesting and powerful with a quantum computer. You don't need uh, the kind of scale of, uh, of terabytes and things that you have in today's computers. On the other hand, we don't even have that yet. We're in the very <laughs> early stages of the technology. The technology is um, imperfect, makes lots of errors, the, the n number of calculations we can do or uh, ca uh, calculational steps we can do before an error happens is very small, uh, um, uh, a few thousand perhaps today. So a grand challenge is to figure out how to do error correction. <coughs> we also need to have a greater understanding of what kind of algorithms uh, can be invented that are what, what kind of problems can be solved uh, more efficiently with this hardware. We understand something about um, optimization problems and simulation problems and um, machine learning classification problems and things like that. But I, I want to be very clear, I've heard a lot about uh, big data and high data rates and things, that probably big data problems and machine learning problems uh, while in principle there are quantum advantages, that, that will be the last area of application for technical reasons that we need uh, for exponentially big data sets. We actually need exponentially many quantum bits, and we just don't have those yet. Um, in terms of timeline, um, Quantum sensing and quantum encryption are here now. I mean, there are even companies you can purchase from, uh, but with lots of limitations in terms of uh, uh, bandwidth and lack of uh, being uh, portable or battle-hardened and so forth. But uh, the, the technology uh, is here. Computation, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I, I, I've been saying at least 10 years for a while now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I just, given that the people who invented the transistor, the laser, and the atomic clock had no idea what they were going to be used for, I hesitate to say what, where this is going or how quickly. Uh, and so I'm reasonably sure there are going to be, you know, just as there were AI winters, there are going to be quantum winters. But I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic that the government is presently taking a pretty sensible, all of government, long-term coordinated approach to investing in this research area. Uh, so I'm, as long as they continue that uh, for, and are patient, I think this is going to lead to um, uh, really interesting new technologies. Exactly in what form and what the best use cases will be, I, you know, it's, that's the future, which I'm still unsure about. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I'll come back to you with some questions, and I'm sure the audience has their own as well. So turning to this question then of uh, how to incorporate and adapt emerging technologies uh, into business operations, uh, would really like to get uh, Mike Hayes's uh, thoughts on this and, and reactions uh, both to the technical uh, discussion we just had on AI and quantum as well as Mr. Innes's comments before. Uh, Mike Hayes is uh, VMware's chief operating officer. I think many of you are familiar with VMware. Uh, it's, uh, you know, one of the world's leading uh, cloud computing companies, uh, valuation of over $60 billion. Uh, and in that uh, Capacity, you know, he's responsible for worldwide business operations, uh, passion uh, for sort of driving agility and excellence at, in, in the customer mission as well, which I'm sure we'll hear about. 
Uh, prior to joining the private sector, uh, Mr. Hayes spent 20 years in the U.S. Navy SEALs, uh, multiple combat tours in Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan uh, at, at some significant command levels, uh, as well as some White House policy experience, uh, Director for Defense Policy and Strategy at the National Security Council. And I'll just put a plug uh, for his best-selling book as well, Never Enough, uh, a Navy SEAL Commander uh, Living a Life of Excellence, Agility, and Meaning. Uh, and I'm putting a plug because uh, he donates all profits to pay off the mortgages uh, for Gold Star uh, families, uh, in which I think you're on the 7th, uh, which is it's what you mentioned to me just now. So, uh, Mike, uh, I, I'm interested in your reactions uh, from where you sit now at VMware. Uh, and overseeing, uh, you know, such a significant cloud computing company uh, just on the verge of this next level uh, of data processing revolution, but also having the, uh, the public sector and the military service that, that you've also had and, and those experiences of uh, inhabiting both those worlds. So thank you for being with us. Ted, thank you for having me. First of all, after listening to Drs. Gervin and Krishna, I'm not sure I'm at the right conference. Uh, <laughs> these guys are way smarter, and I'm hum humbled to be here. I'm just a simple guy who's wearing a kerchief in his pocket for the first time in his 52-year life. So, um, you know, I got this for Christmas and, and tried it out today on all of you. So, um, so, anyways, that makes me super nervous to be here. Hey, uh, thanks to, to Yale, serious, seriously, for putting this on. Uh, a couple of quick thoughts. Look, I'm, ju I'm just a simple guy that thinks about things in a very simple way. I think the art form of really thinking about technology is how do you make complicated things simple? And um, for me, when I'm running the you know, global operations for VMware, I really think about uh, things in a couple ways. First of all, uh, what I would say is, is technology is awesome, but keep in mind that technology is a means to an end. You know, and so technology is just driving and creating value. And so just like when you're in the military on an operation and, you know, one of the things we got better at post 9-11 was working backward from the outcome we were trying to achieve, right? It, it wasn't like, oh, my gosh, I want to go on a mission and let me go put all this training to work, whether no matter what part of the military you're in. It's what effect are we trying to cause and then how do we take the least amount of risk along the way so that we can go achieve that? That's no different at VMware. And see, if you think about the, pro the, the product development life cycle, like right now we, have, we spend four plus billion dollars a year in research and development. And, and how do we think about how we spend our own, you know, our own economics? It's, it's not complicated. It's, there's a, a, a market for something that we're trying to achieve. How do we in, as an organization coalesce around the what we are trying to do? And from there, then it gets to the how. So if, if the vision is the, the where, the, the strategy is really the how. And what, what matters a lot to me is to think about, you know, not me working another two or another 26 hours a day. That's not going to move the needle on anything. I'm in charge of a system. And so when I think about a system, technology is a key part of it, but you also have to have process and policy. And so what it takes is somebody to step back and, and be able to put together and, and do the systems-based thinking to unlock the value that's in your organization. For example, you know, when I'm a commander of a, a special operations task force and I'm, you know, in the, the talk or the jock or whatever you want to call it, you know, I, I walk in and I've intentionally designed myself out of a job. Why? That's so I can th sit there and think about the negative space, not the positive space of what's happening. Everybody's already gravitating toward what their job is already. In the negative space, that's where all of the opportunity and the risk is. So when I walk into a Fortune 500 company now and I say, who here is in charge of what we're not doing, it doesn't compute because people aren't thinking about that negative space. And so when you think about creating a system, how do you systematically go after opportunities and value creation in that negative space? You know, for me, one of the things that I, I enjoyed from, from Bill's presentation was really the crystallization, and I'm going to over, overly simplify here, but if you think about the COCOMs, they are driving outcomes, and when you think about functional providers like a SOCOM or any sort of unit in the U.S., you are truly providing a capability. And so think about the, the, the world when you do the AI pixie dust. What's the outcome you're trying to achieve or what's the function that you're trying to maximize? But be really crisp and laser-like in your thinking around what are you doing and why. And so uh, for me, I think that's what, what really breaks down a lot is, is the governance and the systemization of what you're doing. <laughs> VMware has 40,000 employees. And so if we don't get the, the system right, 
then we're going to fail. And so what does that mean? Go back to, to Bill's presentation. And when you look at, you know, from, you know, satellites to subs and you think about the points in between, you are creating, there is a system there. And so, sure, there, any single node in that system is important, but way, way, way more important is the architecture of that system. And so if you think about architecture, how does information flow back and forth across a system so that any single node can, be, can underperform in this, in, in indivi an individual fails, but the organization doesn't? And so as, as we think about these great you know, quantum compute, AI, et cetera, what, what to me is really important is, is having the architecture right. And I'm a little biased because I'm, I mean, I'm at VMware and that's what we do, but you think about how do you enable an organization to have a really clean application layer? How do you have a really clean data layer? And um, you know, one of the things that, that I've just overseen is the complete rebuild of our entire enterprise's data foundation. <coughs> we have structured and unstructured data. How do you get the most out of that? Well, you know, running a transformation for a Fortune, you know, a Fortune 500 company, it's not sexy to go say, hi, we're going to go fix the data because your sales teams and your, your, your product you know, engineers, et cetera, they don't see the oil that is in the engine and that makes the car go. And so what I, I really would encourage people to think about is really the underlying system, because if you don't get that foundation right, then anything else is a capability at, you know, whether it's on-prem with a hyperscaler on the edge, sitting with an MSP, wherever you are, that is really a, a function of your foundation. So my point is, you know, always prepare for the, the, the thing that you can't see coming. And so when you're writing requirements, think about, to, to, to Ted's point, think about building agility into your system, because by the time something comes to life, there will be a million more use cases you didn't think of from when you wrote the requirements. And so did you create something that is fluid and functional that can be um, not just used for a point in time, but to be, be used for you know, the many, many years to come? So it's a relatively simple point, but it's one that often gets missed. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Sam as well, uh, of course, also one of our uh, Yale graduates, so it's great to have him um, back, as I mentioned at, before at the beginning, uh, as one of our late career uh, Yale undergraduate students, um, <laughs> what we call our Eli Whitney students. Sam uh, came from the special operations military community uh, to Yale for a late year BA and has since uh, gone on to utilize that background for some of the incredible uh, work that he's doing uh, in, in strategy and growth consulting. He is uh, currently Corporate Strategic Growth Director uh, from Paraton Corporation, and there he's managing uh, the growth of, of about a $12 billion enterprise pipeline uh, that's trying to create U.S. government opportunities in defense, space, intelligence, uh, cyber, uh, civilian, and health sectors of the firm. Uh, managing a lot of complex uh, strategies and operations in this regard, uh, and, and in particular, in a perspective that maybe is a little bit different um, than Mike's, is, is working with the startup community as well uh, in the AI and emerging tech space. So I wanted to maybe bring in your thoughts on that. We've talked about uh, the talent pipeline, the acquisition challenges. Uh, what is sort of some of the principal challenges confronting startups in this space, particularly as you think about their potential uh, application to the defense industrial base, uh, and then still having, you know, the major players as well who are established, but, you know, there's a, there's a role for, for integrating new approaches as well. So how do you scope and think about that challenge, and, and what do you think is most relevant for, for this audience? No, thank you, uh, Ted, and uh, it's uh, wonderful to be back here, of course. But before I begin, I just want to give a big shout out to Mike for putting all this thing together. I know it required a lot of hard work because I've been there, brother. So, no, thank you. So I just want to give a round of applause to Mike. Yes. There you yes. go. So, thank you so much. And, uh, and Ted, you and uh, the leadership here at Jackson as well, thank you for keep on uh, hosting these events as far as it is so crucial for our national security to have this engagements happen every year uh, to really get that going. And, you know, there's the thing that I'm seeing right now in Washington is that the need for innovation. Every command, every PEO, everybody is coming to the industrial base and saying, hey, guys, give us real innovation. We don't want the repackaged solutions that you guys have offered for the last 20 years. What is happening? Where is this innovation coming from? 
And one of the things that I've been leading is really the outreach to the startup communities, companies, two, three man operations, brilliant computer scientists, quantum physicists, et cetera, that are trying to do business with the government but don't have a cage code, don't have a facility clearance. How do you get involved with working with the Pentagon or the IC? So, uh, you know, there's many companies that are leading those uh, initiatives, and, and I have to say the Pentagon has done a great job with DIU and establishing an office down in, uh, in the Valley and everything, which is moving the needle, but not fast enough. So we're actively looking at firms that can provide uh, solutions, niche solutions, uh, to really sit on that overarching uh, capability set that is affecting us, like near peer and all this other stuff that's happening, but also the unexpected type of uh, issues that are arising. Just these days, I mean, recently we saw the balloon fiasco that was happening uh, across Montana and everywhere, and everybody was like, how can this happen that a Chinese balloon is able to come into our air airspace, et cetera? Hey, you know, that's what electronic warfare is all about. What are we doing? about creating those electronic force fields, et cetera. There's a lot of research going on, and I'm currently working with the good folks at uh, Georgia Tech uh, Research Institute. They're doing some great work out there, and that's actually being implemented at certain areas with AFSOC, et cetera. But this engagement is also morphing as well, where we're seeing so many threats <coughs> evolve. And the next generation or the current generation of operators need to be hybrid trained in my opinion. They need to have core capabilities, not expert level, but at least conversational level at OSINT, at even human. I'm a human guy. And uh, I think it's very important when you're out in the field, if you're disconnected, you can still function and sustain in that environment individually. And that is very crucial. That is something that I'm very uh, pushy on with the folks down in Tampa and Bragg. And I really want to see uh, those expertise develop and be <coughs> trained for the operator so they're never uh, dependent on so one individual back at the HQ level. But at the same time, I want to say that all the stuff that's happening about uh, AI and ML and everything, that's all great. But we should not forget the basic fundamentals as well. Human is key. I'm going to put a plug in for human just because, uh, because we saw this in the 90s and the 80s. Just because as the 80s, we you know, were launching all these satellites and everything. Hey, no, no problem. We can see anything from anywhere. Great. But we couldn't tap into the terror networks in Philippines, et cetera, in Pakistan, Afghanistan areas. So we need to keep that capability alive, but at the same time, we need to increase and reduce this talent drain that we're experiencing within the NATSEC community that we need to recruit individuals, recruit the next generation, and not just talk about, <laughs> okay, hey, we're going to recruit from these communities, et cetera, but also be competitive about it, right? And recruit, you know, there's a thing, hey, give, incentivize, but also expedite. Facebook or Google gives an offer letter and you start Monday. Clearance level at the NSA is going to take a year. That kid is not waiting. They're not waiting. And we're losing individual, we're losing talent that way. And that is a big concern right now. I was sitting with um, Rob Joyce not long ago, and I was like, sir, you know, we have to pick this up. We have to have programs at colleges that are immediate hires that are helping be the next coding or mathematicians, et cetera, at uh, the National Security Agency because it's so crucial. And um, it's something that is very concerning. But on the tech side, specifically speaking, one thing that I'm very excited about <laughs> is space, all the stuff and activity that's happening in space these days. Just on Sunday, we launched um, uh, the first tranche uh, program that's happening. CubeSats, they're amazing. I think that's going to be a game changer with the ISR platforms to provide that continuous monitoring that's going in a hybrid platform, in a hybrid model where 
you're looking at a target, but also you can launch assets too. It doesn't require long flyovers, et cetera, within the Indo-PACOM region specifically. But uh, these are exciting new you know, technologies that are being developed. But at the same time, all technology is great. But if we don't have the people to out there execute these amazing technologies, that's a problem. And that is something uh, we need to keep that in mind. <coughs> yeah, please. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to ask a follow-up to folks here, and then we'll, get, we'll incorporate uh, all, all of your comments as well. Uh, you know, Dr. Christian, I want to zoom back in on uh, maybe one or two of the layers that you focused on, namely at decision-making and action with respect to AI, because we did have a question uh, from Mr. Bergen earlier about uh, human in the loop, right? And so, and of course, the Department of Defense has this new revised directive now on automation and uh, this concept of, of meaningful control. And so, you know, just based on your own uh, research and teaching and, and the programs that, that you're building at CMU, you know, what's the right way to think about this question of human in the loop? We throw around so many of these terms a lot on AI, uh, responsible use, ethical use, meaningful control. You know, what are some of the the best practices in your view in this space that are most relevant for this audience, which may be ultimately you hoping to utilize AI, you know, in human uh, machine teams, you know, to make, you know, significant uh, kinetic decisions. Uh, and so just give us some thinking uh, on this question. I think that might be thank particularly you. helpful. Uh, thank you. Oh, oh, you it, was, it was on, actually. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Ted. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> So two things to keep in mind more broadly about AI um, is the technology, even though from what you read, you might think it's some magic button that will work perfectly all the time um, in all situations, and uh, that's not the case. Um, it, it's, it's really good oftentimes on narrow tasks. That's where it's been shown to be particularly good. Um, and it's oftentimes brittle when you start deviating from the data on which it was trained on. This is called drift. It's, there's this idea that you train a model on data, and if, and if what you're seeing in the world is not representative of what it was trained on, you might not get good recommendations, good decisions. So one is to recognize that robustness, brittleness, these are things to be really well-educated about. So it's almost like having a, what these are often called data cards or model cards, where for every AI, there's a need to have metadata about, you know, in what range is this AI to be totally trusted? What's the confidence interval, if you will, around this AI? That's sort of a, an important aspect. Now, given the consequentiality of the decision that you need to make, I mean, if, if it's about popping an ad in, on somebody's computer, and if, I, if the AI made a mistake in showing you an ad, that you're unhappy with, that's not super consequential. But on the other hand, if it's a consequential decision uh, that has to do with people's lives or the kinds of services you're providing them or in even uh, where people's lives are at stake and the kinds of situations that you all are engaged in, those tasks, <laughs> the bar is very high in terms of ensuring, <clears throat> you know, are the values that uh, we as a society, you as an organization, have articulated, and this is where the responsible use part comes in. So you have accuracy, effectiveness, efficiency. You want the, the warfighter to be better equipped uh, to be able to make these decisions in, uh, and gain situational awareness, be able to deal and digest data that's, that's coming uh, at, at, a, at a rate that uh, without the support they're not able to provide. All of that is on the plus side of the column. On the negative side of the column might be how do I trust what, what it is that this thing is producing? And how do I ensure that um, what it is that is producing is A, been validated, verified, et cetera? And two, are there, in the societal setting, in domestic societal setting, these are often referred to in terms of you know, ensuring equity, or in this case, it might have to do with ensuring that the values that you have um, that you have to sort of balance are taken into account. So oftentimes, let me give you a, a societal example I'm, I'm familiar with. 
one might be asked to make a trade-off. So oftentimes a trade-off in AI governance that arises is how much is it going to, how much are you willing to trade off on accuracy to get an additional unit of equity? And in your case, you replace equity with, you know, the appropriate dimension that you're, you're uh, concerned about. Or vice versa, um, if I, can I get more of both? Can I be more accurate and more equitable? Or is there really a trade-off? And if I'm going to make that trade-off, what are the weights that people are going to place on these things, and who comes up with these weights? Is there guidance and uh, doctrine that's going to tell you that this is how you're going to have to tra make these trade-offs? So I, I think the, the high-level point that I want to make is, irrespective of whether it's generative AI, the chat GPT-like technology, which makes a lot of errors. Uh, it's not perfect by any means. But it does move the needle on a number of tasks that, that you might be interested in using it for. So that's the accuracy or efficiency or effectiveness end of the dimension. You're always asking the question, by deploying this AI, when can I trust it? So this is the, the part about validity, verification, et cetera. And then when I actually use it, how can I use it in a way where it's in, aligned with my values? And that's where this trade-off governance question comes up between improving ac accuracy and efficiency uh, and this equity point that I made. The larger point uh, that you oftentimes see firms making this decision about when they deploy AI is, um, I think Mike made the point that at the end of the day, all of this is means to an end. It's absolutely true. In, let me give you an example from healthcare. In healthcare, they take the system as a whole. I don't care about whether this algorithm is fair or accurate or whatever. Oftentimes, it's a pipeline. I'm interested in the performance of the system as a whole. And in healthcare, there's something called the quintuple aim. There are five dimensions along which you rate any healthcare delivery system. Is the patient, how do you, is the patient doing better? Is the provider doing better? Is the community doing better? And is, those dimensions, those are called the quintuple aims of any healthcare system. It might be useful to think about, is there the equivalent of a quintuple aim like, like that, should there be something that should guide, which is m multiple criteria, that should guide the assessment and evaluation of AI-based systems when AI is deployed in the kinds of context that you're, uh, that you're working with? And responsible use comes down to how do I play with the parameters? Who's empowered to do that, one? And two, how can I assess and evaluate the system in terms of the uh, objectives and the aims that matter to me most. So that, that's how I would think about it. Great, thank you so much. Steve, I think we're still a little bit off from the use of quantum computing for life or death decision making of the sort that this audience uh, is accustomed to making on a daily basis. But you know, we're still not that far away from being able to scope what some of, of the risks might be. And, and so just give us a sense of what what does concern you most from the national security perspective? Is it the, the loss of uh, secure communications? There's obviously a lot of hyperbole surrounding, you know, uh, whether other nations might develop in this area. I, you know, China, of course, has a very aggressive national quantum plan. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on China's own activity in this space that might be of relevance um, to this group. That's possibly really the only nation level state capable of competing. Uh, are, are the threats in your mind sort of specific in terms of what some of the impacts could be, or is it more this general fear of kind of a loss of national competitiveness as a new next generation technology you know, enters the scene a, a decade from now? Yeah. Um, thanks, Ted. So. Uh, China is indeed um, investing heavily. It's very hard to say from the outside, you know, how efficiently, et cetera. I mean, lots of, just as in this country, many things have been relabeled quantum <laughs> to seek funding from the government. I, I know that's true in China. Um, but they're investing very heavily. Um, in terms of communication and encryption, there's, there's sort of uh, offense and defense, and, and quantum can, can contribute to both sides. In the end, uh, uh, if, if all of this can be made to work well, um, uh, privacy is enhanced uh, because 
There are forms of quantum communication such that even an adversary with quantum capabilities will be unable to, uh, to break the uh, encryption. On the other hand, um, a lot of current encryption is based on the difficulty of, of solving certain mathematical problems without, without a knowledge of a, a key or other, other a crib to get in. And uh, it's perfectly possible and presumably is going on that much of this encrypted communication is currently being uh, captured and written to disks and could be in, uh, decrypted uh, using <coughs> quantum hardware when uh, we're, we're not close to being able to apply Shor's algorithm to do this, for example, now, but it could happen uh, within you know ten or twenty years, so there's a lot of interest in uh, what's called post quantum encryption. Uh, uh, it's classical, ordinary mathematical encryption, but with the different algorithms that are designed to be difficult even for quantum computers. So there's a lot of um, of concerns, I guess, both on offense and defense connected with this technology. Um, the yeah the players in the world are are China, the U.S. and a few <coughs> countries in Europe, uh, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, Sweden, primarily, um, and I think it's very important for to take a long term view of sort of national investments in this <coughs> just because it's it's extreme, <coughs> extremely uncertain there isn't a guaranteed payoff but we need to be uh, you know if there is a breakthrough we need to have the workforce and the technical expertise and the people and the and the ecosystem to really respond to that could I make one comment Please, sparked yes. by, by what Steve said? Uh, in, in all the things that I said about responsible use of AI, one of the things to keep in mind is that the adversary may not be responsible. Um, so, uh, so when you think about that setting, what would it take by way of technology, by way of human capital, by way of systems that we have that would allow for us to compete and outcompete an adversary who might be irresponsible? That's a a good framing for us to think about as well. That's very good. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, one other area that uh, Mr. Ennis touched on, which was uh, cybersecurity and, and supply chain uh, security in particular. Uh, obviously, uh, managing such a vast uh, cloud computing uh, enterprise as you do, you know, the attack surface is vast, right? The adversaries. Uh, seem to be growing in capability, uh, diffusing in capability from the most sophisticated state actors to a wide range of kind of gray uh, actors or even non-state actors in this space. So, you know, emerging technologies, uh, in including AI, of course, have the ability both to accelerate uh, the cybersecurity concerns, right, but also maybe hold out some opportunities for detection and mitigation and, and building resilience, and just kind of curious how you grapple with this challenge from your uh, vantage point and sort of both the risk as well as the benefit. Ted, it's a great question. Uh, like you heard, I spent some time in D.C., so I'm really good at not asking the question I was, not answering the question I was asked, but the question that I wish I was asked. Um, now we'll come back to the cyber thing. I think there's an elemental point to what you're saying that, that is universally applicable to whether it's cyber or any other technology. You know, if you think back, you know, when the bicycle was invented, parents got really nervous that their kids were going to be able to go too far away and they were losing control. You know, most of us in this room remember, you know, we, we started navigating when we learned to drive with Rand McNally maps and now we're on Waze. You know, if it's map and compass, you know, I, I was a Silver Ranger and a, you know, grid square guy and now everybody else is using these little, you know, handheld GPSs instantly. You know, we always have a, a little bit of nostalgia for the past. At the same time, you can't live without the present. And so if you think about those, the, the universal uh, truths of technology advancement, there's always a little bit of, oh, no, we can't let go of the past. 
but we can't live without the present. And so that's a really important thing to remember that as we're talking about models, to Peter's point earlier around like the, the, the previous discussion around, you know, when will the computers be doing everything and we just be watching? You know, that's, um, th that's, that is coming. If you really think about what are we doing, think about the world in three simple layers. You've got data, you've got logic, and then you've got an opinion or, or a decision. And so you very crisply need to separate your data and your logic and your opinion. And all you're really doing mostly is program, unpacking logic and, computer, and, and digitizing it. You know, when I was the commander of Special Operations Task Force Southeast, 2,000 people running everything in, 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 in uh, southeastern Afghanistan in 2012, you know, I personally was the, responsible for 1,100 times clearing, you know, 500-pound JDAMs from aircraft to, to drop on the ground. Okay, so... What, now, what am I, all I'm doing is a decision-making system. And so if you really think about it, all I'm doing is unpacking logic of when to say yes and when to say no. That is, very, Dr. Krishnan and Dr. Gervin could, could program that in a split second. All we need to do is get from like what's happening, not just in my brain, but in my unit's collective you know, brain and getting that down. That is very replicable. Now, the thing is with model drift to Dr. Krishnan's point, you have to be very careful because at some point there will be wrong decisions. And so when there, the, 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 uh, we won't be defined whether or not there are wrong decisions. We will be defined by how we handle the wrong decisions. That's the most critical piece. Just like if we ever did something wrong with a, uh, I mean, I'm proud to say we, we never harmed anybody we shouldn't harm on those 1,100 air to ground drops, but let's just say we did. You know, how do you diagnose down to the root cause what the failure was? That feedback is not different than the product that we're developing at VMware. There's a product for VMware's pr uh, for, for, for our products, uh, excuse me, a market for our products. There's product market fit. You have gaps in between where we are and where we want to be for the market. And then, oh, by the way, the market's always moving. How do we systematically get after that? Well, sometimes we're wrong. A lot of times we're wrong. But as long as we're right more than we're wrong, but how we, we'll de that's okay, will we be defined with how we handle the wrongs? The wrongs have to feed back into that loop. So with cyber, look, we're going to have, I, I, I ran a, a, a $2.5 billion P&L for financial services at Cognizant before being at VMware. That was a, you know, we had a ransomware attack where everything was shut down. You know, and, and when UBS is, is uh, calculating their end of day P&Ls at every desk and then rolling it up to the P&L for the whole firm and saying, um, what, what are the margin calls that we need to make because there were some bad, you know, somebody, some other customers or clients made bad trades. Like, at, like, that's a risk decision that's really critical for, for a big bank. So, so we, if we get that wrong, how do we make sure that we enable the, the, the learning that goes with that? So with cyber, you know, we have things go wrong. How do we get to the root cause of what happened and simultaneously be pressed forward? <clears throat> One other quick point, and, and I, I absolutely, um, infinitely respect the VC community and, and, and the comments that Sam made. I would also just offer a, a counter and a flip side to it. Um, uh, even in the previous, uh, there was a question around, uh, you know, VC. We hold up the word in the military, we just kind of munge VC with private equity. Be careful because the VC world is, all, is not usually enterprise-grade software. I'm a huge proponent of feeding that into the Department of Defense, the national security community, et cetera. We have to have that. However, comma, you don't often find SOC 2 compliant software in the VC space. And so as you, as you look to proliferate where we need to go as a national security community, you have to make sure you connect back to enterprise-grade software that's going to be able to do well at scale. And it's not different than the cyber firms, Ted. Great. Well, I mean, uh, to your point, um, you know, there needs to be accountability, right? If, <laughs> if a DIU vendor is developing a product that SOCOM is buying and it doesn't work, as we heard in the previous session, you know, there needs to be accountability for that with that vendor. Uh, that's where the procurement uh, policy making is so crucial, that because these are NatSec level type of uh, threats that we're facing, and, and if that product were to fail with a unit in a deployed, in a foreign enemy territory, wow, that kind of thing. And, and to your point, VCs are absolutely, they're looking at, first go to market, et cetera, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And they're not taking, they're cutting corners in a way. Uh, but that's why, you know, our, the technical evaluation board needs to be just as where I have to say ATL is leading in a lot of ways with procurement and devising new mechanisms to 
provide that best technical value to the warfighter and holding folks accountable to it. And, and they're doing that by bringing in industry experts to actually uh, examine that product that it, they're, you know, as a third party, mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. them. They're, they're bringing in yep. some professor and saying, hey, sir, can you analyze this? And, and can I jump on that? Yeah, on top please, of the, please. Sorry. The, um, to, if I'm in Bill's role, the thing that I really want to make sure is happening is you have two types of testing before you roll something out. There's quality engineering, QE testing, making sure is the engineering, have you, have you run all the combinations and permutations yep. of what can go wrong? And that, that is often short-stroked in, in any product company because like, you get compressed and you're like late and that's the last step sure. and you're like, oh my gosh, how can we do what we were supposed to do in four weeks in just a week? I do that, just to be clear. And, and I get pushed against the wall and sometimes I need to make a hard decision. Do we miss our deadline or do we say, nope, we're going to test for four weeks? Sometimes I choose one, sometimes I choose the other. But the other part of it that often gets overlooked is UAT, user acceptance testing. Mm -hmm. And so going back to your customers, your clients, and saying, all right, before we really harden this product, we want your feedback from a, a, a consumer perspective. And, and don't forget, the DOD, the national security community, is a consumer Absolutely. that can drive the development of products. Absolutely. And, and field testing, too. Where is it going to be deployed? Will that product work in yeah. that de deployment area? That is not happening, and um, we'll get better. <laughs> Let's open it up to uh, questions and thoughts from the audience. Come on, it's about my kerchief. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I'll ask a question. Oh, we'll get both of you. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to ask, like, can you say anything more about the project that you led that involved uh, the structured and unstructured data and reconceiving that or restructuring that across the company? Uh, I can, and I'll be I'll be quick and glad to take it offline. The um, you know, VMware is a 25 year old enterprise. What happens for you know? I'll talk about VMware, but it's also metaphorically any large enterprise. I don't care if you're Amazon, Google, Microsoft, whatever. You have tangled knots sometimes in these enterprises that are, have just been created because number one is success can create an ability to just go buy the next thing and layer it on. And, and the proverbial you know, spaghetti plate just gets more and more ta larger and more tangled. And so for us, we never step back and actually, like, actually really um, – uh, created the governance around our data, and so we, and we had poor hierarchy, meaning what lives where in what ecosystem, and how do you go? How do you get after that? And so what we operate number one is we created a vision for a new world. We ran on the old world, and then there's a lot of tension in any organization to say, why aren't you paying attention to me? Because I need more paper clips and chewing gum to go run the old stuff. You have to swing. I I, I have limited, you know, a finite amount of resources, people, to, to either run the company or transform the company. So I need to make a decision, how much allocation do I spend toward run and toward transform? The uh, simple math problem, the more you put on transform, the faster you're going to do it, but the louder the complaints are going to be around the run. And so, you know, I tried to get that right over the last couple years. Sometimes I got it right, sometimes I got it wrong. But, um, but where we popped out on the other side was a modern data architecture with, with incredible governance and, and hierarchy so that now we um, can really benefit from the things that Dr. Christian is talking about and sitting on top of, of models that can say, you know, look at what's a customer's propensity to buy. They already have product number A. Are they going to buy product C, F, or L? You know, and, um, and, and these are the kinds of things that can, can ultimately help us drive more top line revenue or save costs and, and therefore improve the bottom line. But why is that important for the national security community? It's because think about the world in a GDP framework. Remember, it's just labor times productivity equals the total economic output of, of, of the world. You know, there are a lot of us in here with incredible pasts. And, you know, at the end of the day, though, we are, we are largely commodities where our government can go buy more of us if they have more money. A lot of us are very expensive commodities, but we're commodities nonetheless. And so more GDP equals more capacity for our nation to create more, you know, special people like in this room or to pay down debt or to buy more health care, more education, more whatever. And so driving productivity for the nation really is job number one. Thank you. Just make a quick comment for, to follow up. One of the biggest challenges with the structured and unstructured data is traditionally our view is 
uh, this data is being used to train models to uh, for quote unquote good purposes. Um, but these data can also be subject to manipulation Absolutely. and become mm. uh, a, a type of a vector for attack. Uh, so you could have an adversary change or ma change the nature of your corpus or inject stuff into your corpus that then uh, gets your model to behave differently than you would want it to. Or the model itself is something that is subject to um, potential attack. So th 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 that's why I think the systems view of the problem is really important to take rather than just look at one algorithm or what the data is. You need to go all the way from problem formulation to data to the methods all the way out to what comes out on the other side. Can I ask you a question? Is that legal? Of course. <laughs> um, how do you know when it's broken down? So the, 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 the big question here is when you have, um, this, so this is where you have to have, if you have ground truth, uh, meaning you know in some cases what the ground truth is, then the question is when there is variance, is there a way in which you can check back as to why the model is not working like it's supposed to? Sure. In the case where you don't have ground truth, this becomes a hugely challenging problem. Uh, but this data contamination problem, which is the problem we are talking about, where you have an adversary attacking the, the data sets that you're training on, itself is something that you can bootstrap your AI around and ask the question, is the data contaminated or not? It doesn't have to be a binary thing, but uh, it's, it's, uh, that itself is a subjective, uh, mm -hmm. you can, it's a topic of study. Well, I mean, data manipulation is so uh, crucial these days just because in the OSINT world, we're seeing the rise of deep fakes and everything that's happening right now, and tools are so important to effectively corroborate that report if that is happening or if this is a fake report or is this a real report. What is happening and what are the actual uh, core sources that it's being reported from? Because there's so much haziness and fuzziness that's happening on the news and what's on. My dad is on Facebook and he's like, did you see this report? I'm like, dad, no, stop. You know, it's just one of those things because there's so much misinformation being pumped by state actors, but also commercial actors as well, too. So that is something we need to be so cognizant the, the, of. The challenge that Sam speaks about, I think, is when you have this type of misinformation getting pumped into the system, yes. and that gets then added back into the corpus, sure. then you get the training of these models being uh, affected by what's been added in. Well, like the hallucination of ChatGPT. That could be for altogether different reasons. Sure. <laughs> it hallucinates for other reasons. Yeah, but ChatGPT is just, it's uh, putting a re response back in a very nice language, but it's also taking rumen as well that's out there from forums, et cetera, whatever, and saying, hey, this is, this is actually what's going on. No, that is not. Because right now in the bottom when that prompt does appear, you don't see any sources, right? But we're going to see ChatGPT also evolve. Right now, it's text-based. So you're reading it, and you're analyzing it. But in like <laughs> six months or a year or whatever, you're going to see a full video production of, I was joking earlier, Professor Gervin's <laughs> six years of you know, uh, lectures all condensed into one hour you know, with a AI-developed Professor Gervin. So it's just one of those things. It's, it's going to be revolutionary, but there also needs to be some safeguards, guardrails around it. And I know some countries are doing that. I mean, some countries have already, Italy, I think, was just banned chat GPT. But it's just, you know, that's where policy needs to catch up. Thank you. There was one other question here, but and then we'll get we'll wrap up. Yeah, hi, Dave Jewell from JSouth. Bear with me for just a minute. So a lot of the things you came up comes into mind as an old planner, as an educator, as a researcher. And uh, the secretary brought up the morning about war gaming uh, in the department usually starts at after deterrence has failed, where soft value is not the same as we propose it is prior to that. And hundreds of types of war games in business, most of them that we use in, in, in the work, most of them are based on correlation of forces and means some sort of attrition model of combat forces. So that clear data, clear logic, so we can get to Mike's opinions based on good research. In the conflict, the contest for influence in spaces such as, you were talking about disinformation, so MISO or PSYOPs, 
information support operations or civil affairs or expeditionary medicine. Is anybody doing this? Because I don't know. And if so, how can we tap into it using the tools of AI and machine learning to collect the data we have to include at some level the excursion into some percentage that is, is misinformation to apply the logics with those parameters that the decision maker set so you can reduce the ambiguity to a decision. One movement that I'm, I'm watching with fascination now is a lot of bespoke, bespoke wargaming in wargaming communities uh, attributed with some of our PME institutions and everything, and they're fascinating. But they operate almost entirely in the opinion world. A war game designer makes rules, makes a good presentation of it, and thinkers go in and bring their, their experience and their, and their wisdom to it and come out with what they do. We learn lessons from that, for military planning. But how can we use AI to take what is a combat attrition model in conflict, like the old movie War Games, and apply it to in the in the space to the left of battle for influence with partners and with that and against adversaries. So right now you asked uh, the first thing was that are we doing this right now? Uh, the Office of Net Assessments in the Pentagon they are doing this. They have some uh, they have a pilot program that they're working with IARPA and DARPA right now um, that is being uh, developed in such a way where it's examining all the war gamings that are ha that have happened with academic institutions, Columbia, et cetera, and uh, they're compiling all of that data and seeing how countries have reacted in the past and how they will react with the current core technology capability they may have and what the investments are. It's still in pilot phase right now, but I'll get with you offline <coughs> and share some additional data with Thank you. Thank you. That's in the Office yeah. of Net Assessment. That's not over in the, the J7 world of the more traditional folks. Yeah, great. I'm, I'm excited, uh -huh. excited and interested in that. I was hoping the answer would be yes. uh, Dr. Christian, final thoughts. Any ideas on use of AI for simulations, war games, or maybe complex decision making that might uh, occur in the future that might help us think um, about uh, strategic uh, challenges? Absolutely. Uh, including the context that uh, you raised, the, the, you know, the, the, how do you, so g conditional on having crisp definition, definitions of what misinformation is, because what's misinformation to you might be just, you know, good information to me. Um, so as long as we have crisp definitions of what misinformation is, then I think the, the challenging um, issue really is that we now have technology, in particular, again, using these large language models that currently have been um, uh, created and made popular. They have two elements to them. The, the first part is what's called a transformer. The second part is what's called an adaptive fine tuner. The adaptive fine tuner is designed usually to take bias and toxicity out of the language model. But that same technique can be used to amp up the kinds of messages I could send to a populace to manipulate them to get max influence over them. In other words, I create different messages, run it by humans, and figure out uh, which messages have the most capacity to influence somebody. So um, what we then have is a, a machinery then that uh, has economies of scale and scope in terms of being able to send out over a network. So if you control some kind of a, so if you take TikTok or uh, a Facebook or an Instagram or any of these kinds of social media platforms, you have the capacity to flood these with messages. And it doesn't have to be just text. It could be, to Sam's point, it could be audio, it could be video. And I think we have a <clears throat> very interesting case study coming up. I think I was in an earlier presentation where there seems to be multiple elections coming up in multiple countries, including our own. Um, so I think you're going to see a very significant amping up of the extent of misinformation and disinformation being deployed on the Internet. And I think it behooves us all, I think, to do three things. I think one, of course, is you know, better technology to try and um, identify and classify and take out and weed out um, uh, this misinformation. The question is, who's liable for it? You know, where, where does the incentive lie to remove that? That's one. The second, I think, has to do with educating people uh, to, you know, as, as, as Sam was pointing out, don't believe everything what you see on the Internet. That's a long-run kind of uh, effort. Uh, and, then, and then the third is being able to sort of um, take these types of, um, you know, this is going to be core to our 
democracy. So do you think about content labeling? Just like we, when you buy wine, you know it comes from um, California or from Italy. Should, should content that comes from an AI engine be actually watermarked? Should it require content labeling? Should there be peer evaluation? You know, wine spectator says that bottle is a 93 and that bottle is an 89. So should you have peer reviews of content? So there are lots of different policy approaches one could think about as well in addition to this, but it's a hugely complex problem, and I don't think there's an easy solution. Uh, and we've been dealing with this now for, it's getting close to a, a decade, um, and we don't have really good purely technical solutions because this is a socio-technical problem. It's not a technical problem alone. So any solution is going to have to be a socio-technical solution. Absolutely. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.